chemo had led, left Susie bald. A middle-aged woman, she wore her baldness apparently without concern, occasionally wearing a hat or scarf, but at other times letting her bald head shine for all the world to see. She seemed unaffected by anyone's reaction. As a white woman, Susie had a very white scalp and its stark surface shone brightly, defiantly, and that made me wince. It forced me to confront my own fears of baldness, my ever-increasing hair loss, my vanity. Okay, so maybe you're thinking that in the face of other losses people have dealt with, losing hair doesn't even begin to rate. That pettiness increases my pain since it will never generate anything stronger than limp pity. Another middle-aged male losing his hair, his flaccid ego clinging to youth that had gone the way of all flesh. Buy an expensive roadster and some loud shirts and call it a day. <laughs> oh, and don't forget the poor woman facing chemo just down the hall there, the one with the unnaturally bald head blazing in the light like an Olympic torch. I'm not as vain about my appearance in other ways. I tend towards the slobbish, loose shirt tails hanging brazenly over jeans to hide my gut. I wear whatever isn't shamefully wrinkled to work, but if my hair is out of kilter, I'm calling in sick. <laughs> Would it be better or worse if this mania was just a result of middle age? Sadly, I've had hair issues as soon as my early teens when I noticed with dread that all the men in my mother's family were victims of classic baldness. The sides and back of their heads ringed with hair while the tops shone bright olive. Even my mom's hair started to thin noticeably after she stopped coloring it. To this day, I'm less troubled by how much gray she has than how much she hasn't. Initially, I became mildly obsessed, staring at the mirror for signs of thinning every time I brushed my teeth. In an, ever, in an effort to escape the inevitable, I wore my hair long, very long, at my shoulders, battling to tame it into place. The front and sides pushed back to maximize the effect. Dark dark brown, my hair tends to be straight and thin, and the longer it grew, the more I could pretend I had a lush mane. Gel and a brush and a hair dryer would fluff it up, and then in more desperate times, hairspray would cement it in place. I can't remember when it was exactly, but I noted a small bump, no bigger than a zit, near the middle of my forehead, just under my hairline. It was my watermark to show me where exactly my hairline was, and over the years, the tide kept rolling farther and farther back, leaving the mark high and dry. In a desperate move, I went to a stylist after years of barbers, and for $80, she chopped off the ponytail I had worn for several years and layered the front. Creating a dam of sorts, the shorter hair looked fuller, buying me some time. But the dam began to crumble. Tiny holes appeared where scalp leaked through. I turned to others for support, but they tossed off names like Rogaine and Men's Hair Club with the same casual indifference you'd expect if you told someone you had a headache. Eh, just take a pill. What's the big deal? The big deal is that Rogaine and its ilk are gateway drugs to the hard stuff, <laughs> to Viagra and Levitra. But these were people who just didn't get it. They didn't spend their childhood watching their father toil away in a bathroom, getting every one of his many hairs in place before he went anywhere, even the living room. Christmas mornings were a nightmare. My brother and I would weep with suspense over what presents sat under the tree for us, waking up early, 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 the only time all year long to shred the wrappings and get to the toys but we had to wait for dad. The hum of the hot comb, like the low moans of some supernatural force emanating from my parents' bathroom, post us to keep it for, posted to keep us from our treasures, broken up only by the tired pleading of my mother who was trapped between ADD kids and OCD spouse. <laughs> for her, it was a flashback to her own father, a man who never left the house without a coat and a tie, the few thin strands left atop his head meticulously in place. And little did she know, a precursor to her youngest son's own mania. I struggled with my hair, sneering with envy at anyone with the slightest hint of curl or body. Then, 
When I was 19, I read in Rolling Stone how the Taylor brothers from Duran Duran used Depp hair gel to tease their dull hair into new romantic plumage. Depp? Certainly this was some sort of high-priced salon gel, but a trip to Long shortly after proved me wrong. There it was, glowing in a natural green in a clear plastic bottle for a mere $5. The gateway drug itself, which combined with my mother's blow dryer, Frankenstein some life into my moribund hair. Brushed forward and then blown back, it was alive. My then girlfriend, Lisa, answered her door and looked at me like she never had before, saying, this is the hair. And shortly thereafter, I finally saw her bare-breasted. <laughs> this dep was some powerful juju. <laughs> but magic fades. Nothing left to do but pay a professional camouflage artist $80 to replace magic with its trashy cousin, Illusion. And that's when I began to notice my coworker Susie and her shiny bald head lighting up the halls at work. Her situation and the courage she bore it with slapped my vanity to the ground. Her ability to face the cruel results of her own body's betrayal forced me to look at my own shallow pride. Fate had thrown her a cruel right hook and she stood proud in the ring, no sign of defeat while I was cringing at its cocked fist towel in hand, ready for throwing. If she could take the blow, so could I. In her scalp, I saw what I needed to do. So when my colleague Andy and I were talking, I had a brainstorm. Ever think of shaving your head, I asked him. You want me to shave my head, he replied. Look, we're both losing the fight here. And if we're gonna go down, let's make it count. Let's shave our heads for Susie. <laughs> this was perfect. Slay vanity not for vanity's sake, but to support a colleague in her struggle. The plan came together quickly, and soon students, staff, and faculty were crowded around us as hair fell to the ground in chunks. Susie laughed. She cried. She shaved. In the reflection of the office window across from me, I could see a pale glow building as more and more scalps shone in the sun. In the midst of it all, I had no time for anything other than the carnival we had generated, feeling overwhelmed by the crowd, amazed that this many people would care. Later, I received emails from several colleagues praising me. Women came to touch my bald head, to rub and coo. Photos were sent out and appeared taped to office windows. One in particular featured Andy and I with Susie in the middle, just our bald heads, all of us grinning like idiots. Examining the shape of my skull, I enjoyed the warm, smooth skin and marveled at my new appearance and how exotic I looked. My morning routine became effortless. Take a shower, brush my teeth, slather my head with lotion, and out the door. No more fussing or fretting. People would ask what happened, and oh, I'd tell them why I'd done it. I could see they were moved maybe even thinking about what they could sacrifice to make someone's life a little better. <laughs> My new hairless existence not only liberated me, it had visibly made me a better person. <laughs> the next edition of a local paper featured the story on the third or fourth page in. I forget the headline, but it had numerous quotes from Andy, who explained why we did it. A great photo of him with half his hair gone accompanied the article. Of course, the article mentioned me and had some quotes from Susie saying what great guys we were, explaining her situation and recognizing her courage. But the balance of the article featured Andy. And I could just catch a glimpse of me in the photo. I read it over a few times, alone in my office with the door closed. Why didn't they use the photo of the three of us, I wondered. That photo really reflected the spirit of the thing. I couldn't remember the reporter being there. Had she asked me anything? I'm sure I gave good quotes, but she must have forgotten them. I started writing a letter to the paper, clarifying some details, such as my role as originator. Like, it was a pretty big deal to cut off all my hair, considering how great it was, I wrote. 
Reading the letter over, I felt nothing but horror and self-loathing. I dragged the file to the trash, angry and disappointed. No matter how good the letter was, and it was pretty damn good, it reeked with the stench of self-pity. My thought to be dead vanity haunted every word. It was three months before my hair grew back. Six months, and Susie had hers back too. In full remission, she would smile when we passed within eyesight, brush her hand through her hair as it grew thicker and thicker, as if she never lost it. Mine came back to an extent. The sides and the back returned to their pre-shorn state, but the top and the front were thinner than ever. Now there was a new little clearing in the tree line of my forehead, a patch that would only know shade if the hair nearby grew enough to lean over it. <laughs> now, when I fuss with my hair, checking it in a window, my friends look at it and cluck their tongues. Shouldn't have shaved it. <laughs> Thank you. Also, Vam, first timer, give it up for Andrew Rump.